This might be the craziest graph in history. It shows how Homo sapiens went from a few chimps in Africa to completely dominating the earth in just a few millennia. How did this happen? The Neanderthals were killing it, literally. They were stronger, faster, meaner. Our brothers up north, they were brutal. And so how did they lose to Homo sapiens? They were more people like me, weak pseudo chimps on the grasslands. And so the answer for who's the strongest ape is somehow the weakest ape, us. So today we're gonna solve the puzzle for why Homo sapiens won and Neanderthals didn't. And fundamentally, sapiens won because our population increase led to cultural compounding. We created a collective brain where we inherit more knowledge than we lost each generation. And so over thousands of generations, our cultural bank account became massive. So today we're gonna to talk about the three parts to this puzzle. First is the crazy explosion and domination of sapiens. Then two, I'll show you a counterexample of Tasmania where small population size leads to bad technology. And third, I'll show you cutting edge research from 60,000 years ago that shows how population size in Africa led to amazing technology. And of course, I'm dedicating this to Jane Goodall, the original chimp whisperer, without whom none of this would be possible. So rest in peace. Okay, so let's talk about the explosion and domination of sapiens. We went from this tiny group here, so 200,000 years ago, we're just chilling in Africa, kind of hanging out. But then eventually 70,000 years ago, we go out of Africa and literally go everywhere in the world. We go to Australia. Eventually when it gets a little bit less cold, we go north. We go across the land bridge and all the way to the Americas. And along the way, we're killing all the other homo populations and we're killing the megafauna. There's a bunch of funny pictures that show what culture may have looked like at this time. So I was doing modern day hunting, you know, <laughs> hunting on the internet and I was hunting for the best picture. And so I think this one shows what life back then would have been like for some of these sapiens. And you can see here that there's, the reason why I like this one is because it shows a relatively large group size is about you know 10 to 20 people here and the average group size is like 25 it also shows different generations where like grandfather and then the, the adults and then the kids learning it shows the use of fire it shows clothes it shows getting one of these being carnivorous and getting a big creature from the world it shows the use of all these different tools as well these especially more advanced tools and not very many of these things were used you know pre-sapiens with other homo species homo erectus homo habilis whatever a lot of this kind of tool use and cultural passing down is unique to sapiens at this time. Here's another picture that shows this. And this thing is amazing. It shows these different art pieces over time. Most of these are kind of these Venus images. And you know, this is the most famous one here. And these things did not exist 70,000 years ago. And then boom, you have this explosion of amazing art, you know, around this time. And you can see this explosion in this fossil record. Previously, most of the Homo sapiens fossils were just around here and there weren't that many of them. And then boom, this is actually a graph of fire over time and being able to see fire. And so you can see it just kind of multiplies all around the world. And before long we see, oh my God, the sapiens are everywhere and they're, they have all these hearths everywhere. And one of the main reasons why we spread is because we kept finding all this amazing megafauna everywhere. It was kind of like our fossil fuels at the time where we'd go to a new land and we'd be like, what's happening here? And it was like, oh my God, there's giant sloths or there's like big beavers. And we would go and we would just be like, oh my God, free meat. <laughs> And these creatures are crazy. When you look at the fossil record, you can see that a lot of these things are like the size of humans or two or three X the size of humans. They're these massive creatures that we don't see anymore. And this graph shows us killing those megafauna over time where you can see this is different continents and this is the large mammal population of the continent. And then you can see the arrows when Homo sapiens enters. So in Africa, you know, we entered 200,000 years ago. And because we entered earlier, the kind of population of Africa began to co-evolve with us. And so it got more used to us. And so that's how we got elephants and rhinos and things, less megafauna mammal death in Africa. And that's why you can still go to safaris and see the Lion King in Africa to get today. Meanwhile, if you look at Australia or North America or Madagascar, the moment <laughs> that sapiens get there, boom, we kill all the mammals on that continent. And so that's why there are no giant sloths or other things on these continents, because once sapiens got there 40,000 years ago, we killed everything. In addition to killing megafauna, we killed the other homo that were around. And so these are Neanderthals and Denisovans and Erectus, and boom, we came out of here. L3 is the name of the like haplogroup that expanded at that time. And so yeah, 40,000 years ago, we made all these other homo species extinct, either extinct or we'd have sex with them. So you can see here is when we came out 
out of Africa, we had an admixture with Neanderthals. Roughly 2% of people's DNA is Neanderthal DNA. And you can also see we made with Denisovans as well. And so especially people in Southeast Asia and New Guinea have Denisovan DNA. And so what that gave us is the explosion of Homo sapiens around the whole globe. That was as important to Earth as the origin of life or the Cambrian explosion. And so again, the question is why? Why did we outcompete Neanderthals? And the answer is having a larger population allows us to keep more knowledge in our knowledge pool over time and then that starts to compound. And now I want to talk about number two, which is a counterexample to this, where Tasmania had a low population size and therefore had more primitive technology. Yeah, Tasmania is a really cool example. Homo sapiens colonized it around 35,000 years ago, back when the sea level was low enough that you could walk there. And then the sea level rose. And so about 6,000 BCE, they lost contact with the mainland. And so that island off the coast of Australia, Tasmania, it used to have lots of good technology. But then when European explorers got there at 1800, they they looked around and they're like, oh my God, this is much more primitive than these other indigenous and aboriginal cultures that we've seen around the world. There's a bunch of ways that you can quantify this, but roughly speaking, they looked at the people, they weren't fishing, even though there's tons of fish around, they didn't have that great of clothing, they didn't use bone tools, even though they had used to use bone tools. And then if you add up all of their tools, there was only like 24 like essential tools, while just across the water in Australia, they had hundreds of tools that were a lot more complex. And so a lot of anthropologists have written about this, including our friends here, Robert Boyd and Peter Richardson. This is a great book called Culture and the Evolutionary Process, which kind of kickstarted the field of cultural evolution. And so I want to show this graph from some recent research of theirs. And what it shows is the population size of different islands that European explorers found or colonized you know, in the 1700s or 1800s. And you can see that there's a direct correlation between how many people are on the island and how many tools the people on that island use. And so if I remember correctly, I think that Tasmania is something like here or here, probably this one, where they have 8,000 people, 10,000 people, but they don't have, they have like 15 tools, not that many tools. And you can see here that a bunch of these small islands don't have very many tools, while a bunch of the bigger islands like Hawaii and things have tons of tools. Here's another graph that shows similar data, but instead the y-axis is mean techno units per tool, which is a, another way to talk about complexity. And so you can think about, you know, a smartphone is super complex while a Sharpie is not that complex. Or for them, it's more like how complex a given item of clothing or a given sharp tool is. And again, you can see that these high population islands have very complex tools and they have tons of them, while the lower population islands have not that many tools and they're very simple tools. And what this shows is that population size is the only way that you can hold on to complexity. Even some of these islands that were connected to the mainland, they used to have tons of complexity. You lose it over time because there are only so many brains in the collective brain. And each time you try to pass down your knowledge, you pass it down in a little bit of a lossy way and you may start to lose complexity that you had and the kind of technology that you had. Nate Bargatze, the comedian, has a great line on this where he's like, you know, if I went back 100 years and I tried to prove that I was from the future, I wouldn't be able to do it because people are like, how do you build a smartphone? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. How does Wi-Fi work? I don't know. How does anything work? I don't know. The technology that we have today is so complex. And the reason it can be so complex is because we have such an, a global network of 8 billion people that are all helping to make and keep that complexity. So we've looked at the counter example of when you have low population size, you have primitive technology and you can't hold on to complexity. Now we can look at some of the cutting edge research that shows in Africa 60,000 years ago, as we started to hit behavioral modernity and all that art and you know language and all these amazing things, these papers show the under underlying reason for that massive increase in complexity and colonizing globe, which is population size, population size and connectedness. So I'm going to start with the simplest one. And what this shows is that even 50,000 years ago were some of the first big trade networks where they see oyster shells up here that look like oyster shells down here. And so this was the sign that the south and north of Africa were starting to be connected by these homo sapiens. Here's another amazing graph that shows this, which is these different regions in Africa, west, north, central, east, and south. You can see over time, these graphs that are going up like this are going through time from 300,000 years ago to 30,000 years ago. And what they're showing is across a bunch of different kinds of technology, like beaded shells or engravings or or coastal work or what have you, you can look at whether that group, that region has examples of that technology. 
you can see a couple things here. First off, the west doesn't do much, right? The north and central do some, and what this is kind of showing is that there are these little bubbles of population that emerge and are able to create and hold on to complexity for a little bit of time, but then sometimes lose it. And that's what kind of happened in the north and central. But then for the south and east, you can see, look at all these bars, all these amazing bar graphs. These things start to become connected. They started to have complexity and hold on to it. A lot of the first signs of modern cognition and behavioral modernity, aka cool art and ochre and symbolism, comes from South Africa around this time that starts to migrate up to East Africa and then boom, Boom, we go across this straight and then expand into all of that and then expand into all of the world. And I actually just want to quote from this article directly with their conclusion. So I'm going to read it here now. They say, ultimately, many human revolutions can only be found at the point when human population sizes were able to grow enough to reach a critical mass capable of transcending losses at the local level and permitting culture to become truly cumulative. Even losses in the collapses of civilizations in recent history have shown how easy it is for humanity to take backward steps without this having any implications for cognitive capacity. See, so yeah, what they're saying is you need larger population sizes to have cumulative culture over time. And here's this final paper that shows how important population sizes were to cultural complexity. And what you can see is this is showing over time from 190,000 years ago, you know, up through the you know present day, a thousand years ago. What this is showing is for each little kind of dot here, each dot is how big of a kind of population size existed in that region. And so what you can see is, you know, 120,000 years ago, the Sahara was so hot, people weren't really there. And then over time, especially around here's, you know, 80 to 70,000 years ago, and then here's 65,000 years ago, right around our out of Africa experience, you see it go from white to kind of this red. And this red is showing that the median group size increased to around you know 200 400 600 in some of these areas and so that's why we get so much cultural complexity here this is why we get symbolism and all these amazing things is because group size started to increase to you know 500. The other crucial thing that that paper shows is the slightly different graph. Again, it's the same over time chart, but what this one is showing is how many migrants are going in between the areas. And so you can kind of see they've broken it into North Africa and kind of West and Central Africa and East Africa and then Southern Africa. And again, the brown is not many migrants and the blue is lots of migrants. And you can see over time, you know, there's not that many migrants, not that many migrants, but then again, look at 65,000 years ago, there was this, look at all this migration happening. These are the signs of these early trade networks and these early connections between groups in Africa. Fundamentally, what was happening in Africa 60,000 years ago happened in Europe, you know, in the year 1500, around the time of the Enlightenment and Scientific Revolution, which is a new collective brain emerged. And what this graph shows is connections between the Republic of Letters after the printing press and people like Leibniz and Newton and Voltaire were starting to chat with each other. And this Republic of Letters enabled this new collective brain of science to emerge in Europe around, you know, 1600s, 1700s. And so what those other images show is a similarly connected network in Africa 60,000 years ago. So fundamentally, this is about compounding. As Albert Einstein said, compounding is the eighth great wonder of the world. And what happens is each generation, the people above you are giving you ideas and skills, and you're getting 95% of those from your kin, and you're trying to understand the world. And then in the past, before we had language in these big populations, you would get some good cultural skills from your parents, but you might not get that much. And the other thing is you might be isolated. So if you have something like 25 or 50 skills, like these little groups had, you'd get all those from your immediate family and they couldn't be that complex and you couldn't hold on to them. Versus once you start to get these bigger meta populations, you get most of your skills from your parents, but you'd start to get more skills and more variation from these travelers abroad that would say, hey, here's this cool new kind of tool. And you'd say, oh my God, this is amazing. And you'd learn that complexity and then hold on to it in your bigger population. So why did sapiens beat Neanderthals and take over the world? We had this big population increase, which led to cultural compounding. We created this collective brain where we began to inherit more knowledge than we lost each generation. And then over thousands of generations, our cultural bank account started to become massive. And if you wanna see another video, Here's an awesome video I made recently on the Cambrian explosion, which was a similar but slightly different adaptive radiation event in the world. Thanks and bye.